there were six committees, eight members each, and then six overseeing um, uh, persons. And James had a plan where there had to be lots of checks and balances. Each committee's work had to be read by another committee and then read by the overseer. And there, there was like four different reviews that every passage went through to make sure that it was done as well as it could be. Uh, this may be the greatest example of writing by committee that will ever occur. I've, I write by committee all the time, and it's just a wretched process, you know? <laughs> so miserable, <laughs> you know? Uh, all the opinions and all the complexity that goes with it. And yet, the amazing thing is, they produced a book of the uniform quality that we have in these uh, some 54 uh, translators. Um, they used, I think it was the um, Bishop's Bible as the control text. They didn't just say, let's take a blank sheet of paper and get out our Greek New Testament. And what do you think that should read as? No, they took, in fact, we actually have some pages from some of the committees where the marginal notes, uh, where they would change a word in the control text into something else, but they would essentially follow what Tyndale had done and what Tyndale had done had gone into the Bishop's Bible and, and some of the other Bibles. Um, made that point. One of the things I find very interesting at the front of the book, and uh, you can see it here in the one that was brought today, the original, it's, it's really worth looking at the uh, title page, the Holy Bible. Now, unfortunately, in, even in King James Version Bibles today, these are not reproduced commonly. Uh, these, are, uh, these front pages containing the Old Testament and the New, newly translated out of the original tongues, uh, and with the former translations diligently compared, uh, et cetera, and then it just says, appointed to be read in churches. Appointed to be read in churches. Of course, anyone who attends an Episcopal church today knows that they still do it, you know, and, and many liturgical churches uh, do. Um, and I, I make this point because there is an oral, oral dimension to the King James Version that is extraordinary. You can look at a page of uh, King James English visually and it can look foreign, but if you have one good reader who reads it well, aloud, it sounds amazingly contemporary. Uh, amazingly easy to understand, even 400 years later. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, Leland Riken, who has taught for years at Wheaton, said, this is the kingdom of the spoken. The ear is the governing organ of this prose. In this age, says Adam Nicholson, uh, people were drenched in the word rather than the image. And there was lots of evidence for that. When you consider ordinary working class blokes who could go to a Shakespearean play and hear it and catch the double entendres, <laughs> Uh, the jokes, the, cle the clever word plays, uh, on just hearing it. I believe that so-called uneducated people in the 17th century had a capacity to receive language that you and I lack, generally. I'm not, I'm not indicting any of you indi individually, but in general, there seems to be in the age of tweets, you know, and uh, three-second uh, blips of this and that, uh, I, a, a real difficulty in, uh, in hearing and understanding. The gift of this language, this swinging between majesty and tangibility, the setting of the actual and perceptible within an enormous and enriching frame, the sense of intimacy between great and small, the most universal ideas in the most humble forms. And then he goes on to say, from God to heifer. <laughs> uh, those can be in the same uh, sentence this plain but dignified language. Probably the best thing we could do today is simply stop listening to me and just open the text and hear again freshly, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 